Hey, it's showtime. Welcome to another rousing adventure of Chill Skills, Sporland Tech Talks. Thank you all for joining us today. You know, it's been over a year since we did a live stream. John, can you believe it? Uh, I can, actually. It seems like it's been a while. Yeah. Good to be back. This is a recorded webinar, and it will be posted to our site for your viewing enjoyment. That way you can watch it over and over again. And the topic for this episode is something to do with the S3 C case control. Yes. This, this part, part two. Part two. Yeah. Part two. Yeah. If you really want to know what's going on, go back and watch part one. We put a link to it in the invitation. Part two is going to be part two of this multi-part series covering the S3C case control product line. And we'll discuss revisions and updates yep. during this episode. A lot to cover with this product line. And here's a shameless promotion for the next one. We'll be releasing new episodes of this epic in relatively short order, just like the other big streaming services. That's right. You know, like Netflix and stuff like that. I'm not supposed to say that. Never mind. Season, whatever. In, approxi sure. in approximately some yet to be determined time period and weeks, we'll have part three ready to go. And during the course of that, we're going to talk about the concept of accelerated refrigerated case delivery and how to mount and wire the S3C control. Now, Sporlin is always here to assist you with your air conditioning and refrigeration flow control needs. You can reach out to us by calling the general number for Sporland headquarters at 636-239-1111. That'll provide options for you to get the customer service or tech support where you'll actually have humans. Mm -hmm. And they'll cover most, if not all, of our new stuff and a good bit of our legacy products. Experienced and knowledgeable human beings. As yes. Well, to add that as well, yeah. Yes. And you can also dial tech support directly at the number we provided to you there on the slide, or you can also shoot an email to them. Of course, we're always here 24 seven at sporland.com. Now, here's the contact information specifically for the S3C control tech support for that. This is what you do if you need help with that. So what about late night stuff you might ask? Well, just take a look at the slide. We got some details on the available hours. And note the email address. It's different than Sporland's regular number. Now, don't be thrown off by this detail. However, when you dial that 888 number, a French Canadian will likely answer the phone. That's part of the dispatcher service that we've hired. Uh, if you call outside of the posted hours, they'll still answer the phone within limits. And if they don't answer, you'll just probably have to call back. But if they do answer outside of the posted hours, they'll likely suggest that you call back during those regular times if you expect to get tech support help on the S3C. Well, we should do introductions here, John. Uh, hello, I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineers. Uh, engineers, I'm, I'm only one engineer. engineer. Sometimes you're, I feel like I'm you're, you're only one. I'm only one. Rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated, and no, I have not yet retired. Though some people kind of act like they want me to. Uh, that's me on the left. That's kind of irrelevant since we're broadcasting an actual video these days. And and joining me is uh, this guy, John Whithouse. He's the our longest running co-host. John is the senior principal engineer for the Sporland division. He's a published author, consultant, and as I have said many times in the past, all around extra smart guy, way smarter than me. All this means John's a big deal around here. Excited to have you. You should say hi. Thanks, Jim. Hello, everyone. Yeah. And, and Phyllis is also in the room. She's our communications director. Did I get that right? Yeah. She tells us what to do and when to do it, and every once in a while we'll pay attention to her. Phyllis, you ought to also say hi loud enough for everybody to hear you since you're going to sit over my, on the other side of my shoulder like that. Hello. Now, this will serve as a short review of the material that we previously covered in part one, just so that you're not completely lost. The S3C is a standalone case control. Standalone means it can function without being connected to the building's automation system. That's really a neat feature, but that's not all. It can also be connected to the building's automation system if you want to do that. How about that? Nice feature. The S3C has an open protocol, and it can be connected to that uh, BAS if that happens to be beneficial to the application. It can 
can communicate with the building automation system via two common control methods, BACnet and Modbus. What, what do those three S's mean, John? What is, what is that all about? Uh, that would stand for safety, service, and security. Well, first safety. What kind of safety are we talking about? Food, food, food safety. safety. Yeah, food that's safety. It's critical. Uh, Sporlin helps our customers to provide a safe food supply. Food safety is the primary function of the S3C. It works to protect the product in the case. Maintaining food safety for consumers is really a good thing to do. What, what's next, John? Service. Sometimes you, sometimes you just need to be able to get inside and take a look at things, uh, so to speak, at least electronically. Tough to do this if the control is simply a black box. And you know what happens if the case temperature is too warm or if the evaporator doesn't defrost completely? Well, the S3C uh, is actually part of a diagnostic system. You can connect to it in a couple of different ways and help to diagnose those problems. Wow. And then there's this security thing. Uh, during the development stage of the product, Sporlin interviewed service techs and facility managers. Uh, we learned there were, was a need for a control device that would continue to function without the building automation system. Let's say something troubling happens to the building automation system or that supervisory controller. In that case, the S3C will continue to function. It will not shut down just because it loses uh, the BAS or if somehow the connection is broken. You're telling me it can work with or without the BAS. That's correct. In a kind of a fail safe way or what this $10 word stand alone, stand -alone. control. This provides some of that security and ultimately safety that we're talking about. It's all about, again, all about protecting the food product in the case. Absolutely. Now, on to some of these revisions and updates, because we said this was all about revisions and updates. Uh, before I forget, John, we've, we've addressed towards the end of this presentation some of the frequently asked questions that come up. Uh, and if we get a chance, we'll even answer a few questions live if one of us knows the answer. In part one, we mentioned there were two RS-485 connections on the case control. And if I get this fancy laser pointer to work, there, there, we mentioned it right there. Now, unfortunately, that is not completely accurate. There's actually on the control itself, only one connection for that purpose. So we've cor corrected that here. Any, this any minor error on that first time around? And we apologize. For I, I think that had something to do with, depending on how many of these different components you put together on the system. So, yep. so anyway, this corrects that. Now, here's some new information on the valve module. The valve module or VM could be utilized for the termination of additional electric valves and additional sensors. Even with mechanical TVs, there may be the need to measure discharge air temperature on multiple coils. That all means it might be darn handy to have the, the VM or, or valve module. But what if you decide to install a CDS valve in the suction line to use as an EEPR? Well, what, what are you going to do if you don't have the valve, valve module? There. So there, you're going to need something yeah, like that. You need something. Now, Here's a, here's a change that's identified. There's now two pulse valve output termination connections as shown on the cover. This is neat. This is new on the, on, the, on the valve module. And let's see here if I can get where, let's see, two solenoid pulse valves and you can see them. One's yep. there and one's there. Yes? Yep. Now, now on, for a three evaporator equipped case, you would, with this being in place, you would only need one S3C control and one valve module, where before you would have needed two valve modules, not one like we're suggesting now, but there's a catch to this. This feature is only active on certain versions of the VM, and we're going to detail that more a little bit later, so keep that in mind. Here's an image of the old display module. Yep, the old one. Yep. Yeah, do you remember that one? Mm -hmm, I do. Now, this one had two quick to view LEDs, one here and one over here, mm -hmm. one on each side of the device. But, you know, got to change things. Here's the new one. 
Actually, I think it's a little sexier looking. Don't, I, don't think you, it's a, I think it's a, a better looking device. It's it's equipped with one LED indicator on top of the device, right right here. Uh, note the uh, the buttons on the contraption have also changed. They've been redesigned. I, I rather like the look of this new one. I do too. Yeah. Now yeah. we've had some feedback that says some folks prefer the feel of the push buttons on the old one, but I guess you can't make everybody happy, can you, John? Nope. In part one, we said something about the uh, S3C walk-in panel could be used to control discharge air temperature. That's kind of a misnomer there. And again, an error that I, I, will, I will take credit for that, but I prefer to say it was your fault. Okay. Yeah, so it really would normally be used to control something referred to as return air temperature on these types of applications. I mean, I could be the scapegoat if you want Oops, to. Well, I'm going to throw you under the bus. Okay. Uh, in this case, that's kind of a terminology thing as it pertains to walk-in type of equipment. And is this the updated image? Yes, it most certainly is. What did we do with it? Well, one of the things that we had to do is, is uh, correctly identify the location of things like the uh, controller breaker. So we made some adjustments to that. Mm -hmm. Fuses, fuses, fuses. We constantly are asked about fuses, and indeed, there are fuses in these devices. In the previous presentation, though, the indicators or pointers for the fuses were incorrectly located. So we had to, we had to make a swap here. The solenoid and fan fuses needed to be swapped with the fans, and so you can see that here. The shorter fuse, physically shorter, is associated with the solenoid pulse valve, and the other one is associated with the fan. Mm -hmm. And then here we've uncovered the case control, and then also we've got a, a fuse that shows up in the valve module as well. And for those of you with a sharp eye now, this is the earlier generation valve module. And here you can see that we've also identified the manufacturer for the fuses and have also included a part number for you. Now this slide has a little animation, so John, you're gonna have to remind me to advance the slide because I'll forget. I might even I'll, go to sleep. I'll do my best. All right. I'll do my best. So here's an update for the valve module. <clears throat> You'll notice there that it has an item number ending with an alpha code A. And you can also tell that here, one of the special things, we mentioned this a little earlier, that it has two pulse solenoid valve connection points, right? There's mm -hmm. one here, I think the other one is over here, right? That's correct. And if you pull the cover off, now maybe if we advance the slide there, so there's even got a nice little orange circle around them in that fancy. And then looky here, there's fuses and relays. More, more orange, festive fall colors. It, a, a pumpkin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a pumpkin thing. We've even identified the locations of those fuses and, and the backup components that would be on that board to make those work. So each one has its own fuse and actually has its own solid state regulator on the board as well. Just like we had mentioned earlier. This, this version is a full featured valve module. It's one that would have been submitted to UL and all that sort of thing. And it gets differentiated by that item number that we've shown you right there. And this item number is located on the back of the valve module itself. So if you flip it over, you can see some of those details back here. Mm -hmm. Now, but like I said, there's catch. Here's the current production version. It's has an item number that ends in an alpha code of E. And it, while it will lead you to believe there's two solenoid pulse output connection termination points. Still still has physically both connectors are still mm -hmm. present on the board. Yeah, what do they call these connectors? Are these Molex kind of connectors? Is that a name for these? Uh, I don't know if that's I'm not sure that's not. exactly the name for those. But these, these Termination points are here. You could physically use them. However, there's only one fuse. There's only one relay. Yeah. So one of them is, in fact, you could argue a dummy. 
So if you're going to say something real pejorative, I'd say like, <laughs> never mind. The fuse, yeah, the fuse and um, relay for that second output on that uh, E version of the module is not present. Now, that was something of a supply chain issue, you know, with good intentions here. And in order to keep parts moving to the field so that they can be utilized, uh, it still has the functionality of the earlier version. And in time, we will correct this issue. But to keep things moving, we had to do what we had to do. There, uh, we find that uh, there's a lot of uh, installations out there that don't actually need that second set of connections. And uh, it makes much more sense to be able to ship product with the features that actually are needed than to have extra features on boards that are not going to be used and, uh, and not be able to ship uh, to the customers that actually need them. So we'll get it. We'll get it sorted out. It will, it will be corrected. Uh, as supply chains start to come back in, in line. Yeah, and then again, if you flip this one over or whichever valve mm -hmm. module you have, you can see details like the item number and, and that kind of information on the back. Now, we've also made some changes to the case control itself. Uh, there is currently a version three where there's quite a few of them out in the field and there is now a version four and when did this happen? Well, the, uh, the, the version three, which has a part number of 953621 is no longer available. Uh, there's literally, I think, tens of thousands of these out in the field, yep. but we're no longer shipping that particular one. Uh, and some of the things that have changed have to do with this aux input and the humidity sensor. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute, uh, but this, started beginning right around the end of June of this year. And, and so you they've can, been shipping for like two, a little over two and a half months. Right, with these. version four, version four. And you can see, it looks like we didn't change the part number. Correct. Yeah, but we got more on that coming up very soon. Now, Here's version three with it wired up in an application. We've even displayed it with a, a dated a display module just for illustrative purposes. We use that pumpkin colored circle again. Mm -hmm. Here's, and here's the new version, which we started shipping in going into July of 2022. Uh, we've shown it with the new display module and functionality is all pretty much in place. Now, as sort of a review, here are some of the, here's a summary of the things that have changed on, on version four. Things that have changed and things that have remained the same. Hey, yep, yeah. so how about that? Let's just kind of review this. How about this one here? Uh, the humidity sensor input changed to 16 volt. Mm -hmm. The auxiliary inputs were separated from the temperature sensors. We kept the same part number. Same part number. And basically, they're well, yeah. The dimensions remain the same as well. Yeah, they look nearly identical. So they will, they will, they will mount in place of, of the uh, previous version as well. Now, here's a little competitive update that we thought would be interesting to include. We've got a, a crosstown rival known as Key to Therm. Uh, their control devices are currently being acquired and installed at, at select big box retailers. I don't have to mention names. Most of you out there know who I'm talking about. Uh, and just so you know, Key to Therm is not a sub-brand of Sporlin. Uh, while Sporlin and Key to Therm are both located in Washington, Missouri, they're different companies. Uh, we're only bringing this up because Service techs have been occasionally calling Sporlin, asking for help regarding these controls, uh, thinking that it's part of our organization yeah. and this is another version of the S3C. And, um, and they are not, and we, uh, we unfortunately, we cannot help with, with those products. We, we don't know those products. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll go down the path as far as we can, as far as practical. A lot of times it's more basic things that are a culprit, nothing to do with the electric, electronic device, uh, but it would simply be better to contact them for help with their products. Absolutely. Now, talking about supply chain yep. and Mr. <clears throat> Unobtainium, these gateways have been a royal 
you know what to get enough of them. Uh, the multi-tech gateway that we're displaying, that we're showing here uh, with its rabbit ears fully extended, by the way, uh, front, back, and top view uh, have been definitely in short supply. We've shipped them as they've been available, but in order to help with that, we've got a new one that's joined the ranks. Uh, this one's made by Bantron. It's very similar in its design. There's the front, back, and top. Notice here we've got a Parker logo on the, on the little devils. Isn't that pretty special? And, and voila, here are the two of them compared, sort of, I'd say side by side, but it's more top and bottom, isn't it, John? It's kind of the top and bottom. Just, we're going to ship both of these as they're available. Yes. Uh, the multi-techs are out in the field. Vantrons are showing up. And from what we to we're told, the, the Vantron version works pretty darn well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, we're moving into one of my favorite parts. Those frequently asked questions. Yeah, frequently asked questions. Those are those questions that we get asked over and over again. Isn't that kind of how that yep. works by definition? Frequently. Frequently. <laughs> Are there any fuses or breakers in the S3C control? That would be a yes. Yeah, we've covered this earlier, but it comes up and it comes up and it comes up. Yeah. Uh, note the position of the fuses in the case control in the valve module. We've also, again, included that manufacturer's name and part numbers for reference. So yes, indeed, there are fuses. Yeah, and it should be noted, uh, please use the proper fuses in these if you have to replace them. Not a strip of wire or something like that. No, no. Chunk of copper or brass. No. And and, that would uh, work, wouldn't it? Um, <clears throat> don't do, don't do that. Where we're calling for a one amp or a 6.3 amp fuse, please do not put a 30 in there. That would, uh, is uh, not good practice. How to barbecue a controller without <clears throat> even trying, right? Yeah. Here's another question. What happens if you don't open the service valves that isolate the pressure transducers. I think I know that one. Well, well hang on, hang on. Okay. But before we answer that question, note that we've got a new version of a transducer sitting over here to the right. You might not have seen these before. These are the RO reliable standby, but we got a new player here. Uh, we've shown examples here of a new pressure transducer. Again, one of those supply chain things. Uh, you notice that they're color coded with a dot that you can see here. And you'll also notice that there's some engraving on the body of the transducer that identifies what it's supposed to be. And we have had reports from some folks that they have difficulty reading this information out in the field. Got a little trick for you if you hadn't already thought of this. Take an image of this with your fancy smart Android or, or smartphone thing mm -hmm. and yep. then enlarge it. Yep. And that seems to work fairly well. It actually works great on these. Now, on to the answer. Okay. What's the answer, John? I was, I was jumping ahead. Sorry about that. What's the answer? <laughs> well, if you don't open up the valve to the pressure transducer, they, they, that would be, they, they won't read. Is that this valve? Yeah. Okay. That's that. That's what, that valve. what do you mean they won't read? Um, no pressure on the transducer, and they'll read pretty much zero. So, well, um, Why would those valves be closed, John? Well, typically those valves would be closed whenever a vacuum is being pulled on the system. Uh, that's to help safeguard the transducer. Uh, a vacuum uh, should not hurt the transducer, but a lot of times it's good practice to be able to uh, to be able to isolate it. And of course, another reason for having the isolation valve there is so that uh, should the transducer need to be changed or serviced at some point in the future, it can be done so without ha without having to lose any refrigerant out of the system. That's an easy thing to overlook, too. It I is. Think. It's it's actually very easy to overlook, but but obviously it's very important because with no with no pressure signals, you're not going to you're not going to control the yeah your your system. All okay. right. So we've depicted two common piping techniques that you might encounter in the field with mm -hmm. with both of these here. Yes. Now here's 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 one that I like. Why won't the refrigerated display case or walk-in cooler get cold enough. Well, again, much of our time, I'm, when I'm saying our time, I'm not talking about John and mine, I'm talking about our tech support folks. Mm -hmm. They spend a lot of time simply troubleshooting typical refrigeration system issues. Things like uh, that don't necessarily have anything to do with the electronic devices or control that are in this application. 
not anything to do with that side of things. A problem could be caused by a blocked or dirty inlet screen. One of the single biggest culprits in these systems, even a new one, is contamination. So you could have a dirty inlet screen on an expansion device. You could have a closed liquid line solenoid valve and then correctly installed solenoid valves. What happens if you put it in backwards? It happens. They don't work so well. Or you could have hand valves like we just talked about that are closed, not only on pressure transducers, but other places. So the thing to remember, it's, uh, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the idea of, you know, that, oh, well, these electronics are, you know, are, uh, I don't understand the electronics necessarily, and uh, that, that must be the problem. Yeah. But um, it's, it's very easy to, to get caught up in that, but it's uh, very worthwhile to remember that uh, all the same issues that can happen to a, uh, a conventionally controlled, you know, non-electronic system can happen to these electronically controlled systems as well. Yes. And oftentimes that's really what's going on. A lot of times it's actually the basics. Uh, it's, it's not actually anything to do. Uh, with any of the electronics. Hey, you know, it could even be an EPR mm -hmm. that's not adjusted correctly. It could be throttling before the system ever achieves the expected control temperature, yeah. and it simply needs to be adjusted. It could even be an EEPR, which is being influenced mm -hmm. by the control device. Certainly. Certainly. And just as a tease for future viewing, we'll discuss how to make the software setting changes to the EEPR yeah. in a future S3C webinar. But we, should, but we should also point out yes. that these system parameters, these different pressures and temperatures around the system, uh, the S3C actually makes it easier to tell what's going on there. You don't actually have to go around with the gauges and, uh, and yeah. things like that. You, know, you, you can actually access that information much more readily through the S3C uh, and actually save time on that basic system troubleshooting using uh, the S3C's built-in features. Absolutely. Another question. And finally, where can I go to learn more about this crazy S3C stuff? Well, that's, that's a great question. Indeed it is. Uh, we did include a link to part one uh, of these S3C webinars in our invitation that we went out for the part two. Uh, you can go back and review that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also access Sporland's YouTube channel, Sporland Video. Not only can could you watch part one there, but we've got other videos, some of which lead into this whole concept. When you look at methods of temperature control and how to, how to control a, a refrigerated case with electronics, we've got a number of different presentations out there that help build on this whole concept. And we're gonna continue Correct. with more of this kind of information. And there's more specific stuff that you can access, that you can download these different bulletins. They're yep. all free of charge to you. And several, just- Several good bulletins online. Absolutely. Several of them, not, yep. just, not just one or two. And as a reminder, we've got part three coming up. As soon as, as soon as I get my dead backside moving and get it finished, right? And we don't have a date yet on it, but we're, we're hoping to have it out there in just a few short weeks. Here's a reminder for that contact information specifically focused for S3C tech support. It's what you do if you need help with that product line. Mm -hmm. And here comes the commercial, John. Sporland.com. Yeah, for product literature, virtual engineer, that's Sporland's product selection program and a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. You can even view encore performances of all of these webinars on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, it'll appear on our Facebook page first if we do it like we've done it in the past. YouTube channel will come a little later, but eventually it'll be out there. And I, I got to say at this point, a big thank you to our internal team. They really make this whole thing work. Phyllis, of course, handles the invitations and sets up the webinars. Jennifer always makes the slides look so very professional. Dennis edits and posts the final product out on social media for you to review again and again. And Brandon, Brandon, our IT guy, just is invaluable to help us put this on. And That's a big right. thanks to you, John. You're my longest surviving co-host. I like the way you use that term, surviving. Yeah. That's uh, It's a good thing you don't, aren't wearing a red shirt, but I'm not too many people would know what that means. <laughs> and remember our internal S3C tech support engineers, Jim R., Pat, Chris, and Dwayne. This is all a team effort. We couldn't do it without everybody pitching in. Now, at this point, that concludes our webinar today. 
Now, unless we've got some sp specific questions that have come in to us on the chat I, or otherwise. I don't know that we have anything that we can necessarily really answer uh, live. Readily live. live. Okay. Yeah. So I tell you what we'll do with those questions that you've submitted, because we're about to run out of time. Mm -hmm. And you know what happens when that happens? Then our the guy that's running the show here stops the meeting. So before that happens, I'll commit that any question that's been submitted to us during the course of this, we'll answer directly back to you and then we will post them online. Right. And we'll usually then take those and turn them around and create some fancy blog that I get credit for writing. So with that- Good, good for you. Yeah. With that, I say, please join us for the next one of these. That includes our webinar for today. Thank you so much. See you next time. Thanks, everyone.